Hello, class. Uh, glad to be back with you. As you know, I'm in the Philippines this week, and so greetings from there. And uh, we are looking forward to having class together with you. And uh, uh, we'll have about 20 minute lecture, and I'm left you some assignments to work on to fill the rest of the hour. But uh, looking back to being with you and uh, uh, studying together again. We're going to talk about, and I sent you the material on this, is Islam a religion of peace? We've already talked about how we should deal with world religions. First of all, as Christians, people who are religious in any uh, world religion are good people. They're moral people. They're trying to prove themselves. They're trying to prove their family life, uh, they're trying to uh, honor uh, a power greater than themselves, which of course uh, other world religions have their gods and goddesses and they have their, uh, their beliefs. And uh, so we deal with them out of love. The early church began in a pluralistic, very religious uh, world. Uh, Paul on Mars Hill is a great example of that. He even complimented them by saying, I compliment you basically for trying to worship even a God, maybe you don't know his name, the unknown God. And uh, you're very religious, you're very, very devout, but uh, you need to know about Jesus. One question we get asked about a lot, and we certainly are not going to look at this in the context that some people do, some people ask the question, why would anyone want to be a member of the Islamic faith because of the terrorism and because of the, the bad things that have happened? Well, there's bad things that have happened by adherents of every world religion, even Christianity. People claim to serve Christ. People claim to serve God. And they participated in the Crusades and other things such as that. So there have been evil done by people who claim to be religious and maybe feel that they were, but certainly it's not what Jesus teaches. And of course, as we've already looked at, as the foundation and introduction to this study of world religions, there is only one true world religion approved of by God, and that's the religion of Christianity the religion of Jesus Christ. And the theme verse for that is when Jesus said in John the 14th chapter, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But people will discuss with you when they're talking about Islam and even other world religions, uh, it's discussed, um, is Islam a religion of peace? The main tenets of Islam can be very appealing. I've given you a list of what they believe and the main teachings. The call to believe in one God, the God of Abraham, our God, the God of Moses, our God, the God, Jesus, our God. It's a call to repentance. They teach a call to repentance and submission to the will of God. They have named him Allah, but they think and believe it's the same God that we worship. It's not, and we'll talk about that a little later in this class, but they believe it, that it is. And it's a call, uh, Islam has a call to holy living involving diligent prayer. We should be ashamed of ourselves maybe sometimes. I've thought about this as I've traveled the world and been in Islamic countries and seen how devout the people were when the Islam call to prayer was, uh, was given. You can hear it the mullahs and, and uh, uh, their um, temples, their mosque, call people to pray five times a day. People very devoutly do that. Uh, fasting during the month of Ramadan, their holy month, charity, pilgrimage to Mecca once in their lifetime. Yet the early history of Islam, and that's interesting. And there's some good books, and I'll mention some books when I get back. I've, I've got quite a few of them. If you study the early history of Islam and recent events, many people are left wondering, is Islam a religion of peace? Let me tell you this, it did not begin as a religion of peace. Muhammad and his early people, his early Caliphs, his early uh, leaders, 
did not practice peace. They were conquerors, okay? They were conquerors. First of all, they were conquerors for these different reasons that we want to look at. Reason number one, to make Islam the universal religion. They wanted people to, to come to Islam and worship Allah, follow their teachings. And they called for people to do that. But they also have a caveat to that, beloved. And that is, if you're not going to do it voluntarily, we want to make you do it. The religion before Allah is Islam, submission to His will. In the Quran, it says in 3.19. Generally, that statement is understood to mean that the true religion in the sight of God is Islam, and Islam alone is the way to life acceptable with Allah. It is also their objective is Islam and Islamic doctrine is to be proclaimed over all other religions. Okay? It's meant to be accepted by all. As a matter of fact, here's another quote that we find from their scholars. Allah's revelation through the Holy Prophet was not meant for one faith or tribe, one race or set of people. It was meant for all mankind to whom, if they turn to Allah, it is not, if they turn to Allah and realize that it's a message of glad tidings of His mercy, and if they do not turn to Him, it is a warning against sin, the inevitable punishment. Okay? Now, Number two, their objective is to create Islamic political states. In Islam, there is no division or distinction in what we in the West call church and state. If Islam ruled the United States, there would be no other religion in the United States except Islam. In places like Saudi Arabia, Iran and Iraq, and other places in the world, Islam, when the government takes over and they're Islamic, then religious freedom goes out the door. A lot of Christians in the world are being persecuted tonight because of this. Christians that are found by Islamic people, especially those who have a radical bend, are persecuted a lot of times and even killed. We've all seen the horrifying uh, pictures in Africa and in the Middle East of this happening. They have no toleration for any other world religion. And it's very foolish in the United States because we feel like everybody believes like we do. And we feel like, well, there's nothing wrong with being Islamic and Christian and Buddhist and anybody else, and we can all get along and because we have religious freedom. They do not, beloved, believe in religious freedom. And if you try to go to Egypt tonight, you try to go to Cairo, and you try to preach the gospel in the town square and establish a church and set that church up according to the New Testament pattern, choose elders and deacons and go out into the community and proselyze, beloved, you will be arrested and even worse. They have no religious freedom at all. So they believe this. They believe they're doing the will of Allah and by persecuting other world religions. And uh, we need to realize that Islam is not content to be practiced, as we teach and believe in the United States, as a personal religion. Its goal is to create the ideal Muslim community. And all political states, all people in these states, they create with all the citizens are required to submit to Sharia, which is Islamic law, okay? And this is the aspect of Islam that creates the potential for great conflict among the nations. Christians view the kingdom of God completely different. As we know, write these verses down, please. John chapter 18 and verse 36. John 18, 36 teaches that 
Jesus here is teaching that his kingdom is not of the world. His kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. Also, Romans chapter 14 and verse 17. Christians can live under any form of government. We can live in Islamic countries. We can live in communist countries. We can live if they would allow us to preach and teach our doctrine, our beliefs. But it's these people that believe that their religion has to be and must be followed and they must force people to follow it and they're doing their God's will by forcing people to follow it that causes problems. That's not Christianity. As a matter of fact, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12 through 17, we read and study, and let's open our Bibles there. That's a very important passage. Here Peter is writing toward the end of his life. And so in 1 Peter chapter 2, he's going to talk to us about our dealing with government and world religions. 1 Peter chapter 2, and we'll start with verse 12. Everybody open your Bibles there. And notice what the Apostle says here. Peter lived during one of the cruelest emperors of the Roman Empire. His name was Nero. Nero persecuted Christians. And it's interesting when we read this passage together that we're going to do here in a second to think about that this man that he's telling us to respect not his actions, but the fact that he is the head of the government. This man in whose government they live under, the Roman Empire, all early Christians lived under the Roman Empire, and we should respect that, and we should respect the laws of that empire, unless, as Peter himself said with John, we must obey God rather than man, as they were commanded to do something against the Christian faith by the Sanhedrin in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. But it's interesting to note that this same Nero, the same Roman government, was the emperor and the government that killed Peter and Paul and killed so many other early Christian martyrs. But notice what he says in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting verse 12. Maintain good conduct among the Gentiles, so that in case they speak against you as wrongdoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right, you will put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. Live as free men yet without using your freedom as a pretense for evil, but live as servants of God. Love all men. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This makes Christianity, beloved, and we're comparing and contrasting Christianity through all these different world religions and worldviews, uh, this makes Christianity unique of all of these worldviews. And it is a beautiful challenge for us as God's people to live and honor and respect who the ruling power is. But Islam doesn't teach that. As revealed in the Quran, uh, jihad, uh, there's all kind of uh, definitions of jihad. It's spelled J-I-H-A-D, jihad. And, uh, of course, the form that we're more familiar with is uh, the one where terrorists fight and attack others. 
As a matter of fact, the Qumran says, and the Qumran 8, Sirah 8, 39, make war on them until idolatry will cease and God's religion will reign supreme. And the Quran, Surah 9, that's their chapters, Surahs, 29, fight against those whom the scriptures were given. Do not embrace the, and do not embrace the true faith until they pay tribute out of hand or are utterly subdued. Now, a lot of people who are Islamic today, and we must be honest, do not believe in jihad as expressed by the radical groups among the Islamic religion. They teach that jihad is just self-control, yourself, submitting yourself to God, submitting yourself to uh, uh, man, and uh, honoring God in that way. But there is a concept that teaches the Islamic people that it's okay to fight and to attack and to conquer and even to kill those who do not follow their religion. The early history of Islam basically was a war, wars. After the death of Muhammad, the first four successors to Muhammad, known as the Caliphs, were men of war, men of war. For the next 300 years, the history of Islam involved expansion through military conquest. They conquered the Middle East. Okay, Civil war, as various Islamic factions struggled for power, there were assassinations, massacres, execution, and inquisitions of Muslims by other Muslims. Okay, And in modern Islamic nations, in every country where they have taken over the government. Sharia, Islamic law, is embraced. At best, if you live in those countries as a Christian, uh, you, are, you face discrimination, social ostracization, and harassment. And at worst, non-Muslims can face prison, torture, and death for practicing their religion. Modern day... Islamic people appear to be going through an identity crisis. Moderates seek to redefine their religion as a spiritual struggle. Extremists seek to define their religion as a literal struggle. Which view of Islam that will prevail remains to be seen. But the true religion of peace, proclaimed by the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ the Lord, is what the world needs. And we're so blessed to know of Jesus. And also, we look for opportunities to share that with our Islamic and all other friends. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and no one comes to the Father but my me. Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And Paul told the Galatian brethren, as we looked at last week, that we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached, let them be accursed. And it's interesting that he used the word angel, because the Islamic religion supposedly was started by the angel Gabriel speaking to Muhammad in the desert of Saudi Arabia to start this new religion. But as we've seen in its doctrine and now as we've seen in its worldview and its goal, which is to conquer the whole world with that religion and to make sure everyone practices that religion even under pain that's something we as Christians need to be serious about practicing our faith and also trying to share our faith with others who desperately need it. Thank you so much. I will be back with you next week, Lord willing. Uh, follow your assignment. You can finish the hour doing that, and uh, we'll get back together and catch up and continue studying world religions. Thank you and God bless you. 
See you soon. Bye-bye.